And, and John, you know, I was born eight years after the end of the Second World War, and all my teachers at school were aware of the risks that were around during the Cold War. Yeah. I'm hearing the same rhetoric. I'm hearing the same language now from what are potentially, again, fascist and communist regimes. Uh, you know, a lot of people are saying, I've been saying it for a while now, it's a lot like the late 1930s, uh, and we can't afford to be complacent. What are your thoughts on this? Do you think we need to be ready to be called up to fight Russia? Well, John, I think uh, the whole strategic landscape suggests we need to uh, uh, gear ourselves for conflict at some stage in the next five years. So we've got a totalitarian sort of uh, almost alliance. Uh, there are certainly acting in concert between Russia, China, Iran and North Korea right now. And they're flexing their military muscles in all sorts of directions. Mm. We've seen Russia pushing on uh, Ukraine. We've seen Iran trying to destabilize our allies in the Middle East. Uh, at the moment, China's all over the East and South China Sea and threatening Taiwan. Uh, and this week, we've seen North Korea uh, threatening uh, South Korea. So it looks like this axis of autocracy uh, is starting to use uh, its military muscle in support of its diplomatic uh, and also economic uh, collective uh, uh, objectives. So I think Patrick Sanders is right. Uh, I actually had this conversation with him a year ago. Uh, and I did ask him whether uh, he thought that uh, he'd need national service to boost the army, particularly in view of the lessons coming out of Ukraine. And I think one thing that we've learned from Ukraine and indeed Israel is that if you're involved in a major war uh, with your neighbours, uh, you're going to need to mobilise the whole of society. Mm. It's not just about the armed forces. Where do you stand on that? What is your own personal opinion, Chris? Do you think we do need, I don't know, certainly to ramp up our prepar preparedness for mobilisation, but what about the idea of national service? Have we got well past that now? We haven't had it since, what, the 50s? No, I think the concept of national service uh, can be modernised. Um, if you look at, um, I think it's seven of our European allies, they have national service. Uh, let's take one, Denmark. You, you, all, all young people have to do national service uh, of some sort, and you can choose whether you want to join the armed forces or not. Uh, and I think it's probably a concept, if it's updated, can have its time again. It teaches a lot of skills that people need in the workplace, particularly the workplace that is evolving now. It gives people discipline, a uh, sense of belonging. It, it offsets gang culture. There are all sorts of social economic benefits that come from it if we get it right. Mm. Uh, and I have to say, we do need to be able to regenerate manpower in the same way we're going to have to regenerate ammunition and things like that if we get involved in conflict. And, and John, you know, I was born eight years after the end of the Second World War, and all my teachers at school were aware of the risks that were around during the Cold War. Yeah. I'm hearing the same rhetoric, I'm hearing the same language now from what are potentially, again, fascist and communist regimes. Uh, you know, a lot of people are saying, I've been saying it for a while now, it's a lot like the late 1930s, and we can't afford to be complacent. Yeah, well, national service would certainly be a, a cultural leap from where we are now. Now, what about the regular army? There is something of a recruitment crisis, isn't there? I mean, I was seeing the other, not just the other day, how uh, the Royal Navy was advertising on LinkedIn for a rear admiral, a retired rear admiral, to to be in charge of our submarine fleet. And the the the... the, the on the ground, the, the British Army, it bans, doesn't it? Anyone uh, recruiting, signing up, if they have tattoos. Should that should that be changed? Well, John, I mean, uh, a lot of this is reflected by uh, recent trends that have actually sort of deterred people from joining. I mean, we had the RAF saying they didn't really want uh, sort of white men joining for a while because they had quotas to fulfill on the diversity spectrum. That's ridiculous. We just want the best people for the job. And if you're deterring a section of our community from actually joining, then that's ludicrous. The fact of life is that uh, we, we've outsourced recruiting. When I say we, uh, my successes in the Ministry of Defence have outsourced recruiting to Capita. Let's name names here. We've made an awful job. Of recruiting the best recruiting sergeant believe it or not is a sergeant or uh, obviously a chief petty officer in a recruiting office this the second best actually is a successful war the falklands was a fantastic boost in recruitment because it showed the country why we needed our armed forces uh, so uh, our leaders our politicians have to instead of going through the motions of saying the most important 
uh, job of government is defense and security, they actually have to walk the walk. Mm. Uh, I've heard so many politicians say there are no votes in defense. Um, and as long as that is the case, the public won't rally. Uh, they won't think that the job is worth doing. I had a conversation uh, with the head of a high street retailer this week at a leadership conference. And he said to me, well, of course, the armed forces is just another job, isn't it? And I actually said, look, uh, the people I've worked with over 35 years, OK, have been ready to sacrifice uh, their limbs and their life if necessary. I said, none of the people in your department store sacrifices their life or limbs in defence of the knickers counter. Oh, OK, Rear Admiral, retired Chris Parry. Always great to hear from you, Chris. Thank you.